Microphone. Okay, there we are. All right, still in the book of Acts. And uh, today, um, well, let me just put it this way. It's a bizarre demon story. You know, when you preach verse by verse through the Scripture, as I do, there are some passages that you're saying, you know, if I was preaching topical messages, I could preach 20 years and never preach on this message right here. Because uh, this, this is, a, as a matter of fact, I was reading one commentary, and one commentary said, this passage does not flow with the narrative, it's inexplicable, and he skipped it. I'm going, whoa. Well, I can't skip it. People expect more out of me than that. So, Today we're going to look at a bizarre demon story. Now let me tell you where, where Paul is. Paul is right there in Ephesus, see it in the middle, uh, right under Asia. That was Asia in the Roman Empire. And uh, you can see where Ephesus is today. It's in, it's in western Turkey. But back then it was in Asia. And everything that we're talking about today takes place right there in Ephesus. Paul actually spent over two years there. In Ephesus, it was a thriving, thriving church. As a matter of fact, last week we saw that people from all over Asia heard the gospel, and many, many people got saved. So we come to verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out from them. Um, okay, so, all right, moving on. Uh, so, so here's, here's the thing. There's, um, uh, in theological terms, there's what we call biblical theology. And biblical theology is what you know about the Bible. You know, you, you know the, you know Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and you know the 12 sons of Jacob, and you know Moses. That's biblical theology. You know what's there. Well, then there's the systematic theology, and here's what systematic theology is. It's putting it all together in a fine, neatly put-together puzzle and say, here's how it all fits. Now, uh, 20 years ago, my systematic theology was a lot more developed than it is today. Uh, and the reason is because in 2003, I started studying the Bible through every year, and I wrote notes. Now, the writing notes was the problem, because when I come to a passage, I felt like, well, I need to explain the passage. And there were some things, especially in the Old Testament, that are way difficult to explain, and here's the reason why. Because most preachers and many, many commentators try to explain the Old Testament in light of New Testament grace. And uh, David did some things that are indefensible by today's standards. Moses did some things that are indefensible by today's standards. But they lived in a culture that was totally different, and the Old Testament is simply faithful, and this is inspiration, inspiration, faithful in telling us what happened. Now, if you're trying to justify everything that happened in the Old Testament, like, Animal sacrifice. Animal sacrifice, how would that sell in today's culture? I mean, how would that sell? Now I'm, and it's going that, that, that you can't even uh, kill an animal to eat it without people being all over you. you got to buy it at the grocery store instead. <laughs> so, I mean, it's getting more and more and more difficult. So in the Old Testament when I realized that this is biblical theology right here, I need to just explain it. When it comes to the systematic part of it, what fits where? Uh, I have to wait till I get to heaven to figure out why God chose to speak through a donkey. Don't know. I have to take that witch of Endor uh, issue that happened back with Saul and and Samuel appearing, and whatever, I'll have to ask about that when I get to heaven, because when you're doing the nice box of your systematic theology, and you got stuff that's hanging out, 
it troubles you at first, but then I realize, well, you know, to everything in life, there are some exceptions in God. Here's my systematic theology. One line. God can do whatever he wants to whenever he wants to do it. And so here's the, here's the deal. Don't, don't question. Don't question what God does. So here's an issue where they take these handkerchiefs, the Greek word, it was the sweat cloth. It's what, uh, and his apron was the work apron because, you know, their, their garments that they wore, the, the, the robes, they didn't have pockets. And so if you worked, as Paul did as a tent maker, you wore an apron and it had the pockets to put your tools. So they were gathering these things from, I guess, his shop and taking them out. And uh, they were, people were, diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Well, that's, that's a little hard to put in context when it comes to what I teach and have taught for years about God's healing. But it all fits, it just fits in a bigger box than, uh, than I would like, you know. You know, you've, you've seen the pranks at Christmas that you probably played on your wife or your kids where you got something they want, but it's in a tiny box, but it comes in a big box, and it's in a box, and a box, and a box, and a box, and a box. That's way fun, isn't it? Isn't it way fun? If you do that every year, you'd be a jerk, but, but it, it's, way, it's way fun. Who does it every year? It'd be way fun to do it. Okay. Someday, hopefully, you'll tire of that. So, so... Uh, so, so this uh, this systematic theology box on healing is, is a little bigger than you'd like for it to be. Now, we're not given any specifics of exactly what happens here, but here's what I know. Uh, any given time, uh, any day of the week that the mail is delivered, somebody's going to get a little piece of cloth in the mail, and it's been anointed by somebody and lay this on your shoulder or your forehead or whatever hurts, and God's going to heal you. If you show your faith and seed your faith with a little cash. <laughs> now, I, I've gotten many of those. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, um, <laughs> uh, I had a relative, uh, I should say an in-law, that uh, just gave and gave and gave and gave and gave to these people because we want hope, right? I want to I, I wanna know that things are going to be better. I'm, I'm an optimist. I want to know not only that they're going to be better, I want to know how they're going to get better. And so there are people on the radio and the TV praying not P-R-A, but P-R-E-Y-E, praying on these people in the name of praying for these people. And their motivation is a prosperity message where they're just trying to get rich. So this passage right here, I'll admit to you, is a, is a systematic theology conundrum. You're looking and saying, they did what? You mean they just went, they just took his apron. How many handkerchiefs did he have? They just took, the, and, and people got healed? Somebody needs to explain that. Well, I'm going to try. But wait, there's more. It gets better. Then some of the itinerant, that means traveling Jewish exorcists. <laughs> what a country, huh? Here you are up in Asia. And you got... Traveling Jewish exorcist. They exorcise. They, uh, not exorcise, but well, walking, I guess they did that too. But they exorcised uh, demons out of people. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. So here, get the picture. They're not even saved. They're just, they're just Jewish. They haven't accepted or embraced Jesus Christ as their Savior. But 
with the great success that Paul was experiencing, they're saying, we could do that. And by the way, even the Egyptian magicians, even the Egyptian ma uh, magicians, they duplicated, well, they made the rods, and Aaron's rod ate their rods. That's cool. Go back to the rod store and say, lost my rod. What happened to your rod? Oh, Moses' rod ate it, you know. But So even they duplicated, they duplicated miracles, the, these, all the way down to the gnats. They couldn't do the gnats. That makes no sense, does it? If you do all these other things, you can't do gnats. Uh, but anyway, uh, even they did things that caused the people to go, whoa, look at that. Now, uh, I like to record America Got Talent, and they usually skip through the magicians. Uh, I just like to hear the singers. Because uh, I, I record it, and then I scream through it and watch the singers and uh, but every once in a while, a magician will catch my eye, and they do some things on the show that you're thinking, surely, surely the cast and the crew and the, surely they're all complicit. How they do that? So, uh, well, who was the uh, the uh, the magician from Copperfield? Remember, he made the plane disappear. Yeah. How did he do that? You know, smoke and mirrors. That's what we say, but. But we know this, we don't think it was real magic, do we? All right, so here's the deal. These exorcists made a living traveling and doing miracles that impressed the people and made them think that it was real. And so uh, they then, with the success, because Paul's, Paul's message had gotten all through Asia. You saw how large of an area that was. So they're saying, hey, let's do this. Let's get on the coattails of Paul and let's go start exercising in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. So that's going on. Jewish exorcist. You ever misuse a piece of equipment you had no training on? I have. Many times. Let me tell you one, about one particular. Back when I was 15 years old, I'd been living with my father and my stepmother for five years, and my mother asked if I wanted, my biological mother asked if I wanted to go to the farm, her, her dad's farm. Actually, she lived down there too, part of it was hers, and help them harvest tobacco. Well, the answer to that would be, you kidding? But then she said, we need somebody to drive the tractor, haul on the wagon with the. And I was 15. I wasn't yet. I had a, a, a driver's permit, but I didn't have a license. No, no, no. You couldn't get a permit till you were 16 in Kentucky. You had to keep it a month and you drove. Uh, but uh, so I didn't have that. I was 15 years old, and uh, so I went out there every day. And there was always a you know they they chop it and put it on the wagon. Then I'd pull it. I had to pull it up this road. And uh, yeah, I'm a pretty good tractor driver. I'm thinking, I'm doing good here. Uh, there was there was a place on the road that was all washed out about mm, about 18 inches deep, big gully down the middle of the road. But it wasn't just the middle; it kind of wound along the road. And so, as I'm going along the road, I'm good while it's level. And then when it heads up, this time the wagon was loaded down a little heavier than it had been loaded down. So as I start going up, I get to where the gullies are, and I straddle the gullies, but the front wheels rise up off the ground. And uh, your tendency is to turn the wheel anyway, but when you look over and they're flopping in the air, you're thinking, it's probably not going to work. So, so the tractor just keeps going up and up and up, and finally I hit the brakes, and I'm sitting about a 45-degree angle. The wagon's behind me. And uh, I was in a bind, you know, and I guess it was my uncle that hollered, uh, let it go backwards, let it coast backwards. And so I did. And then he taught me something that would have been really, really nice to have known. The brakes on the right and left big tractor wheel. Because when your front wheels come up, you steer it with the brakes on the back wheels. And so there I was, had I not had a little bit of help from outside hollering, do this, then I'd have been upside down on the tractor. So 
So sometimes you've used equipment. Uh, you know, I get a device, electronic device. I rarely read anything. I just hook it up and go. And if it goes, I've saved a whole lot of time. If it doesn't, I may have burned something else up, but still, it's a chance worth taking. Uh, I know we've all misused a piece of equipment at some point in time. Not like these guys. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. They were exercising in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? I just love that. I, that's the only part of that verse I know. But I quote that all the time. Substitute names, you know. But uh, So that's what the evil spirit threw the man's mouth. That they're trying to exercise. He says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And uh, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now, that's got to hurt your reputation as an exorcist. I mean, it's, it's got to... You come out of the house, uh, were all seven of them in there? I mean, and all... Of, really? What happened, guys? You got to make something up. You can't. You, you can't tell what really happened. You got to make something up. I mean, you know, since you're doing something you shouldn't be doing anyway, a little lie added to it's gonna, gonna hurt. I mean, uh, well, that's that's a little hard to fit into systematic theology, right there. What a story, all packed into these verses. Now we got two difficulties. Um, now, by the way, uh, when you were demon possessed. It, it looked like mental illness is what it looked like. So mental illness was what they classified as demon possession. Now the reason I mention that is because Pope, I think Gregory in the 7th century, um, equates the woman of Luke chapter 7 that went and washed the feet of Jesus, you know, uh, and it refers to her as a sinner woman, a sinner woman. Uh, that woman was a woman of the streets. And he associates, he associated that with Mary Magdalene. And you know, to this day, many people think that the woman in Luke 7 was Mary Magdalene and that she was a prostitute. A lot of people... And they then further validate that by the fact that in Luke 8, verse 2, and in Mark 16, 9, it says that out of whom Mary Magdalene, Jesus cast seven demons. So they see there, it's the same woman. Now, uh, I, uh, I heard a presentation not too long ago where uh, Mary Magdalene became the woman taken in adultery in John chapter 8. And he was talking about God saving grace and how that, that Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And that how Mary Magdalene began to follow Jesus. I'm going, oh, yeah, no, that's not Mary Magdalene. That's, by the way, not Mary Magdalene. The sinner woman in Luke chapter 7, I know you thought it was Mary Magdalene, maybe some of you did, that's not Mary Magdalene either. Uh, the fact is, is demon possession looked a lot like mental illness and caused people to not act rationally. Don't be going home accusing your wife or husband of being mentally ill, okay? This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. When Jesus ministered, when Jesus healed, it was for a sign to the Jews. Always was. He didn't heal everybody at the pool of Bethesda. All those sick people lying around the pool. How many did he heal? Just one. Just that one. If Jesus came for the purpose of healing, why didn't he heal everybody? Because his purpose was to die on the cross to save us from our sins. To be the Messiah. That was his purpose. 
And the miracles that he performed were simply to validate his claim as the Messiah. So these healings followed by demons, well, it gives us a lot to think about. Because here's what happened as a result. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. When, when I was in high school, going to my Southern Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, um, we used to have youth fellowships after church, and we played with a Ouija board. You know, it's... Uh, you ever play with a Ouija board? Just me and Rose, it figures. Okay? Just... That's how she got Brad. <laughs> so... So, yeah, we used to play with the Ouija board. And, 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 you know, you spend your whole time with the Ouija board with your hand, you, you know, your fingers on that thing, saying, you moving it, and they're accusing each other of moving it, and, and it's, it's just moving. I don't know what that is. But I know this, that back, if you read this passage right here, they burned those things. Because anything... And the Ouija board, by the way, made by, I think, Parker Brothers, they don't make any bones about it. They make it look like you're contacting the spirits. Now, here's, here's what you've got to consider. Are there spirits? Are there angels? Of course, we believe there are angels. And are there angels who fell? Of course, Scripture says so. And so these angels who fell are these spirits. Do you really want to be summoning those guys up to help you out? I don't think so. And so these people, after they've seen everything happen, the, uh, the man who is demon-possessed takes down these seven sons of Siva. And they go, whoa. Yeah. So they came in. They, they brought in 50,000 pieces of silver, depending on what kind of pieces they were, anywhere from 10,000 to forty or $50,000 worth of uh, of evil craft. Now, if you think about that, that was a lot of people right there. So the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. Now, you're kind of excited thinking, wow, we're out early. Yeah, no. Because it all started with the healing in the, at the hands of Paul in verse 11. It all started with the healings. So what about those healings in Acts chapter 19, verse 11? Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. It became a great opportunity for charlatans who made their own systematic theology through today, saying that this is a thing. You send me money, I send you this cloth, and you can be healed. A lot of money made on those things. But what about those healings? I mean, we really do want to know, don't we? We know sick people. We've been sick. And uh, we really, really, really want to know, uh, you know, what that's all about. When you're sick, and the doctor doesn't give you much optimism... That's usually the only time that people turn to the Lord and say, Lord, can you help me here? You know, I, uh, uh, I think all of you, I've worn it out in Bible studies, but haven't told you much about it on a Sunday morning. Back in, um, back in April, I uh, uh, started getting these stomach aches, you know, real bad pressure in my stomach. And uh, so by the time May rolled around, I went up to see my dad, Everybody there diagnosed me with gallbladder, a bad gallbladder, and you get that thing taken out. So uh, I, uh, I had a pretty good week there at my dad's. The next week we went to Julie's house to see my son, uh, my grandkids, one of my grandkids graduate, and I had a pretty good week that week. But then I got back home, and every every day, I mean every day, that day went by. Every afternoon, my stomach would start hurting terribly. So. I, I went to the VA and had one of those, uh, you know, baby check things, you know, sonograms. 
Um, one of each. And, uh, and so uh, the report was complicated, but I did gather from the report that I didn't have uh, golf stones. Uh, just found out like two two weeks ago what I really have, which is nothing, uh, nothing serious, and uh, so st- still had the terrible pain. So then I start looking up things like stomach cancer, and I start looking up, I start looking up uh, bleeding ulcers, and this went on for four and a half months, and I prayed every day, Lord, help me out here, show me, show me what this is. I'm cutting out foods. People have then diagnosed me as lactose intolerant and gluten. Uh, I mean, everything. It just keeps rolling in. And so I'm skipping all these foods that I love because I think I've got something something terrible. And then the night we were here setting up for the Friday night thing we had in October, remember, the, uh, the many set up uh, and many and helpers. Uh, I, was, I was sitting down and, and thinking... And it occurred to me, you know what? I've been doing it for a couple of years. Stevia in my tea. Stevia is a natural sweetener. And you know where you put like a cup of sugar, maybe a cup and a half into a gallon of tea? With, uh, uh, with stevia, if you put a, a teaspoon, that's too much. It had to be like two-thirds of a teaspoon. And, uh, and I've been drinking that for actually a couple of years. But then I thought, could be the stevia. When I was at my dad's house, do this out. Didn't use stevia. Could be the stevia. It's natural, but so is poison ivy. You know. I forgot one of you pointed that out to me. I forgot who it was. Uh, and and so you know that day, the next day, no stevia, and I haven't had a pain since the first week of October. Now, Lord showed that to me because my gallbladder would be out right now if I if I'd let the doctors have their way. They just start taking things. They, I, I'd be a skinny person right now with all those organs they would have taken out. But, uh, you know, I asked the Lord to help me. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, Lord, why did you wait four and a half months? to? Why? I, I don't know. But all I know is I don't have bleeding else of stomach cancer or bad gallbladder. It was just stevia. What about these healings right here? Well, why divine healing anyway? In verse 17, we see here the Lord, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified as a result of what happened. In verse 20, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now, I should point out to you that God doesn't heal everybody every time. I know this because If you read the Gospels of Matthew 13 and Mark chapter 6, here's what you find. In Nazareth, because of the disbelief, the unbelief of all of those people, says Jesus didn't heal many people there because they did not believe. So here's what I know. Here's what I can gather from that, that there's a belief component from the person who's being healed that must be there for that person to be healed. Now, by the way, Yeah, I can show you exceptions to that too. However, in most situations and in the what is most frequently found is there needs to be the belief on the person who's being healed. So, James chapter 5 says this, verse 14, written to the church. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Then it says, And the prayer of faith will save the sick, in verse 15. So I'm told in the scripture that we are to pray for the sick. Why, if it doesn't do any good? Well, the reason is because obviously it does. Now, Here's where the fallacy comes into the issue of divine healing. Is miraculous healing from God a thing? Absolutely. I know many people who've been healed. Um, As a matter of fact, there's a 1% chance, 1% chance that once you go on 
kidney dialysis that you come off of kidney dialysis. Yet Bob's sitting right there. He was on kidney dialysis and he came off. So I know God heals. I know that's the case. I, I know my dad, his stomach was torn up when I was a teenager. He had uh, been diagnosed with the doctors with ulcers. Had it for years. Got prayed for. His ulcer went away. He went in, had a cup of coffee with a bowl of chili, and didn't have any problems with his stomach. Uh, I don't think ever. Now he still eats everything he wants to eat. So I know God heals. The issue is, can everyone be healed from any disease or illness if they have enough faith? And the answer to that is, I'm sorry, I wish it were so, but no. You only have to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul is talking about his thorn in the flesh, which, by the way, we see in Galatians chapter 6 was an eyesight problem. And so Paul had, uh, had uh, as, as a matter of fact, on the road to Damascus when he was blinded, it says after he got his sight back, scales fell from his eyes. I don't know what point Paul became blind. But he wasn't completely blind, but he didn't have very good vision. And he was a young man, should have had good vision. But in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, And I asked the Lord three times to take this from me. And the Lord said, Nah, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It was God who told Paul, Paul, this healing that you're desiring, I'm not going to give it to you because you can't be effective in your ministry without this thorn in the flesh that I've placed upon you. So no, God does not heal everybody every time. As a matter of fact, if you read your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you read an occasion where for this cause, for the sin of many people in the Corinthian church, for this cause many are weak and sick and many sleep, for if we would judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Sometimes, and I know it's hard to swallow, especially if you've always believed God heals everybody every time. Sometimes God is the one who actually brings the ailment upon you because of disobedience. That's a hard pill to swallow right there. But First John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. However, that doesn't mean that you normally or that you naturally always get restored to good health when you stop defying God. So the relationship with God, good people sometimes get sick. Good people die. When a young man dies, we just say, "Why, Lord, why? So, explain this, Lord. Well, Lord, God doesn't have to explain anything to us. But the fact is, is God is glorified. Jesus is glorified, even through our illnesses. But nonetheless, how do we know? How do we know if healing is in our future? Well, you've heard me, you've heard me many times say that the secret is James 1 5 verses 2 through 4 talk about trial adversities could be sicknesses that come in your life and then James says you wonder why that's happening well here it is James 1 5 if any of you lacks wisdom you don't know why it's happening let him ask of God who gives all men liberally upbraids not and it shall be given him so when adversity, whether it's sickness or something else, comes in your life, get down on your knees, start praying, start asking God, Lord, explain this to me. I need wisdom. I need to understand. I need to understand what's happening here. Even when Jesus was rejected, he still prayed for people. He still wanted people to experience salvation through him. His infirmities, when he died on the cross and suffered as he did, he 
could have at any point in time backed out and said, not doing this. His infirmities are a picture of how a person goes through trial, goes through infirmity for his whole ministry. And we need to have that as the example and follow that example. Now, there are name it and claim it, faith healers. And uh, it's commonly taught, just reach out and claim it. And, uh, of course, I came through this for quite some time. In my early years, I say quite some time, no, really only uh, three or four years. And, um, and the, the prayer when you get into the hospital and you're meeting with somebody and they're on their sick bed, you want to you wanna give that coach's talk. You know, that coach's talk that's going to lead to the victory. And, and yet, if you, if you do that, if you do that, come on! I, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, Satan. And you, and you know what? Somebody prays that and you say, yeah! But it's more than that. It's a lot more than that to get the healing. A lot more than that. Um, I, you've heard me tell this story many times. My, my, my friend that I uh, took to the uh, camp meeting in Lexington. And after the uh, camp meeting, they had a healing line and a, and a prophecy line. And um, they were doing prophecies over people. And, and my, this, this gal, she, she said, I'm going down to get my eyes healed. She had like 2,300 vision. And uh, so she went down. And uh, I waited there at the seat. And when she came back, I said, so what happened? She said, I'm healed. She'd been wearing glasses all of her life. She said, I'm healed. I said, man, that's fantastic. And so we rode home, her glasses in her purse. She never, you know, didn't think anything about it. Well, a couple of weeks go by, and she starts making terrible, terrible grades at school. And her mama says, well, honey, what's wrong? She said, I can't see, mama. Well, here's, here's, here's what you don't see that happens at faith healing meetings. Here, here's what you don't see. Uh, the... The name it and claim it means that if I go get healed, I must claim that healing right there and not doubt it. Because even though I may not realize it right there at that time, I may not realize it, I claim it anyway as having been done. And if somebody asks me if I'm healed, I better say yes or I'm not really, really claiming my healing. And so... So, by the way, by the way, some people do get healed. I'm not saying nobody gets healed. Some people do get healed. It has to do with God's will, why you got sick in the first place, what God wants from you in the future, what God needs you for. Lots of ingredients into whether you get actually healed or not. But in the faith healing movement, you got to claim it. you got to just say, no, this is mine. I'm claiming it in Jesus' name. There's a faith component. Let me rush through this really fast. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the foundation of everything that we have in God. It is faith. It is the, the substance. That there is the, is the foundation. It's the word for foundation. It's the foundation of everything we are in Jesus Christ. So the mechanics of faith, clinically speaking, because if you go on the National Institute of Health and read all of those peer-reviewed articles about faith, there are a bunch of them there. And faith there is defined as a congruence of belief, trust, and obedience in relation to God or the divine. Now you know what congruent figures are, don't you? Okay, me neither. All right, they, let me tell you what they are. Uh, if you have if you have three um, uh, geometric shapes that are identical, could be mirror images, but they're identical in dimensions, those are congruent. So this says when belief, what you believe about something, they're using it in a different word than the scripture does, trust 
and then follow through with obedience, when those three things are congruent, that's faith. Well, I get that. But it also says that that in the Scripture, what we just saw, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, here's the deal. It's clinically proven through many scientific studies. You can look at them at the NIH, the National Institute of Health, that optimists experience healing and health more than those who are not optimistic in their outlook. In other words, What makes a Christian optimistic? Faith. So so people who are pessimists who think it won't happen, I won't get any better. I'm just I'm sick. I'm just it's not going to get any better for me. Now, when I had my stuff, I didn't I never accepted that for one moment. Because I'm an optimist. I always think that everything's gonna work out. And uh, I just always think that I'm a chosen person of God, and I am, and you are too. And that God wants me to be well, I would say healthy and wealthy, but the wealthy part hasn't turned out. <laughs> that God wants me to be healthy for the mission that he's called me to, and so I always am optimistic, and that is because of my faith. And so, however the, cl- uh, the, the clinics gauge it, whatever they say about it, faith fosters optimism, and it is clinically proven that optimistic people are healthier than pessimistic people. It's just the way it is. If you're a pessimistic person, get over it. Get optimistic if you want God, God's best. Faith builds optimism. That's the way it works. Our faith magnifies the name of Jesus Christ. Here's how. People look at our faith they look at our health. They look at our happiness. That's what magnifies Jesus Christ. God's people, let's stand together, please.